Hi everyone, this is Dr. Garana. We are here, season one, episode two, uh, Hair on Air podcast. Welcome, welcome again. Um, today I have such pleasure to talk with one of my friends from hair restoration field, Dr. Parsa Mohebi. Uh, before I share a little bit about him, I, I want to share how I how Parsa captured my interest. And that was a couple of years ago when I read his publication on how he improved and cured, in a sense, psoriasis with hair transplantation. And that, for me, was like, wow, what a great idea. Because once I had a patient with vitiligo that I planted grafts into the area of vitiligo and his pigment came back, and that totally made sense because hairs are coming with pigment. And then I saw his uh, publication on psoriasis and I thought that was just brilliant. And from there, I'm sort of like following everything he does because he's one of the leaders in our field of hair restoration. So today we have here Parsa Mohebi zooming out from Los Angeles. Hi, Parsa. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me and um, uh, thank you for the... Uh, nice words. Uh, I'm glad that you're in touch. Uh, we've been back and forth with uh, all the, uh, you know, uh, newest techni- technology through Zoom and other communication technologies. And you guys are doing a great job uh, on East Coast and we, we're checking on you. Uh, I hope we can answer some of the questions, some of your questions uh, and some of the audience questions. Yes. So um, I'm going to introduce you now, who you are, and then we can go to the topic of this podcast. So Parsa Mohebi is an internationally recognized hair transplantation surgeon. He did his surgical residency at the University of New Mexico in in your hospital. He joined the Department of Surgical Science of John Hopkins School of Medicine completed his fellowship in hair restoration at New Hair Institute and worked with one of the greatest names in our field, famous William Bill Rassman, as I would say the man, the myth, and the legend of, of our field. And I hope we're going to host him again a- as well soon. That'd soon. be great. Um, Parsa is inventor. He has two inventions so far, Lexometer and Mohebi Implanter. He's an author of Modern Hair Restoration book, and that's something we're going to talk about as well. Uh, As I was getting ready to this episode, I really looked into your website, and and it's really amazing how much useful information there is for me as as, as a doctor, but also for patients. Your Instagram is so much fun, but you're also one of the very few doctors that have TikTok. Oh my God, you saw my TikTok too? <laughs> I was so fast and I was like, oh my goodness, this is so much fun because you're keeping up with technology and everything that... I, I can tell you, I can tell you, I cannot take all the credit. One of the girls in my office, she is, you know, 20 something year old and she's, Dr. maybe you have to do TikTok, you have to do TikTok. I said, no, people go dance in front of the camera. I'm not going to do that. I said, oh, you don't have to dance. You do this and that. Yeah. I said, that's fine. Let's start doing it. And it was fun. Uh, we were doing it on a regular basis now. Yes, it's, it is actually fun. So from everything, everything I listed, like, who are you of all of these things? <laughs> everything a little bit. A little bit of everything, right? right? Thank you. Yes, yes. I mean, you have to. I guess you have to keep it uh, updated with the uh, different things that comes up. Right. Uh, we, right. We're, we're very open to the change. I think you have to be, especially in the field of hair restoration, because uh, you, you know how everything has changed in the last 10 years, right? Yes. To the point yes. that the procedures that I did eight years ago is completely obsolete. I'm not even doing it anymore. Yes. So now yeah. you have to be flexible. You have to be open to changes. That's exactly what we're going to be talking today, because the title of this episode is Modern Hair Transplantation, and we're going to go from how it all started to where we are today. So can you briefly guide the listener through the evolution to today? 
of hair well, transplants? It's, it's a, it's a uh, very short but rapidly changing uh, field. Uh, like 50 years ago, hair restoration was barely like a science and the you know doctors knew that if he remove a piece of the skin with hair and implant it somewhere else, it can keep the hair and it can bring hair to the new area. So it will, used to be used for like constructive surgeries. And then in America, uh, they started doing it like small, like biopsies or like pieces of hair bearing uh, skin to the balding area. And, you know, to their surprise, the hair was growing. Uh, the result was not as anywhere close to what we have today, but it was hair on someone, somebody's head that they couldn't even imagine having hair before. Right. And then they, right. they fine tuned it. They came up with the mini grafts and micro grafts and the smaller and the smaller and then microscopic uh, preparation of the grafts and follicular unit transplantation. And then in the last few years, follicular unit extraction or excision has been on the rise to the point that we can get hair from anywhere we want, anywhere that we can ha have fine hair and we can transplant it to an anywhere you, we want. Uh, so that's a you know very quick uh, summary of uh, the evolution of hair restoration. But in the process, we've had so many different devices, so many different uh, right. improvement in the understanding and the concept of hair restoration that made us be able to do what we are doing today. Exactly. And I think what is pushing us is also demands and expectations from our patients to be better and, and, and better. Absolutely. I remember Absolutely. when I started this, um, I used to work in a hospital in, in Serbia and, and uh, I was the only one doing hair transplant in my hospital. And, and my former boss told me, that's so easy what you do. You take one hair from the back and you put it in the front and... That's exactly the evolution of hair transplantation, that it's not only that. That used to be 30 years ago, but now it's, it, it's so much more. And right. so how would you characterize modern hair transplantation in terms of technique, technology that you mentioned, right. and, and, and results that we, we can achieve? So, so modern hair restoration, I think what, what we are and what we probably should be in the future that could, I mean, modern hair restoration, of course, is a vague term. It's evolving, still evolving. Uh, we should be able to remove hair, uh, special hair, different types of hair that we choose to remove and place them in the areas that we have to put them so we have full uh, control on what kind of hair and what kind of donor hair we can remove and how we remove them and how where to put them with the right angle and orientation and distribution and not losing even one hair in the process. Right. Because right. a lot of our patients don't have a huge source of hair. I mean, yeah, some people are very hairy, like, you know, they have body hair, they have beard hair. But some people, like, they don't have beard hair, they don't have body hair, the scalp hair is all they have, and that could be limited too, and they may happen to become class 7. Right. So right. one single hair becomes so important. Every graft basically is becoming you know, critical in the success of their, 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 their you know, treatment. So modern hair restoration allows the physician to remove hair from different parts of the body and put it wherever they want in the right natural looking. So we can mimic the nature. We can mimic, mimic what we, we, were, we were born with. Uh, so with, the, with modern hair restoration, even a trained eye I, my example is a hairstylist. Even a hairstylist who work with your hair closely should not be able to detect that this is not your natural hair. And many times, many times they, they don't. They got, they caught up by surprise. Um, you mentioned that we can pick uh, hairs that we want to use. And, and um, by that, of course, the new technique, let's say new, but it's 15 years old now, FUE technique, help us to like cherry pick which grass we want. Do we want bigger grafts? Do we want thicker hairs, thinner hairs, and everything else? How much is technology ha helping you as a surgeon to improve your results? Well, well to put, put that in a you know, perspective, I have to tell you how we started. I mean, when I started doing uh, hair restoration with FUE technique, and I learned it from Dr. Rasman, he is one of the pioneers of FUE procedure. He wrote the initial he wrote the paper. publications. He wrote the paper. Yep. 
Yeah. Right, right. So, so we used something called a crown punch, which was a manual punch that was, was going in and out and getting the graphs out. It was great back then, and we thought it was as good as it could get. But then we, re- we realized that we have a lot of transaction. A lot of hair didn't make it to that graph. So we were losing some of the follicles that could have potentially given more hair to the recipient area. And then we started changing the size of the the you know the punch, and we, instead of going in and out, we started rooting rota- rotation punch. Uh, basically, rotation movement was the biggest thing that happened and uh, made us be able to do manual or uh, uh, motorized tech technology. Right. Uh, manual right. was was good. I was using it for many years, and then I realized that my joints are getting like you know you have to do it thousands <laughs> of times every time. Yep. And I, yep. I figured that I'm not going to be able to do it for many years if I want to keep doing like that. And then I switched to motorized tech techniques. I made my own machine that I, I, I was the only one using it, so I never you know promoted it. And then you know came along different technology, different uh, leaders in the hair restoration. Jim Harris came up with. The safe, safe system, system that was great. It was a good improvement. It was a uh, like blunt tip that was uh, kind of more controlled. And then uh, Trivellini came along with his multiphasic system that when I started using it, I said, "Oh my God, everybody should be using this machine. Nobody should, should be you know touching anything else." And then that gives you a lot of flexibility in different um, you know type of hair, different skin textures, uh, curvature of hair, everything. So you pretty much can. Uh, change the setup of the machine from one patient to, to the other and be able to get 100%, very close, I cannot say 100%, but very close to 100% intact hair almost every single time. Right. What, what fascinated me in that process of different devices, um, I, I actually skipped the manual phase in my career. So I started... Uh, oh my God! I pay the price. I started. I started with Neograft at the time, and then s- switched to Safe System of Dr. Harris, and then we also had our system, Jeff and I. Um, and I thought it could not get any better. And then I tried the Wad drill from from Jean, and I realized yes, grafts are getting better, and with Trivellini system as well. And you think. You can't get any better. You're doing everything you can as a surgeon, but then you, you're given this perfect tool that improves right. Your, right. the quality of your grafts and also the, 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 the healing of the donor area. The donor area suffers less trauma with these devices, definitely. That's, right. that's, right. that's, that's, and the speed, you remember the manual or the like it, it, event safe system? It was you had to you really really take your time. Yes. And yes. extraction was a big portion of your procedure. Like if yes. the procedure is yes. eight hours, you were extracting for like five hours of it. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Then now extraction is becoming a, a small portion of the procedure, so we can pay attention to the other you know implantation and different things that are probably even more important. Yes, and grafts are out of the body less of a time, which is. Great for, for yeah, the graphs for, and for yeah, the outcomes. Absolutely. And um, so, so we mentioned the, the FUE uh, as a method to, to take the grafts out. Where do you think FUT, which is traditional strip procedure, stands or does it stand a chance with uh-huh. FUE yeah. now yeah, yeah. and in the future? What What is your view on that? You know... Eight years ago, if a patient came to my office and asked for FUE, they had to twist my arm to give them FUE. <laughs> because we were, <laughs> you think about it, we were losing grafts. We were killing hair. Yeah. And if yeah. That, that patient was supposed to be class six or seven, they already have, uh, you know, donor recipient mismatch. And now we want to lose some of the grafts because of that. So, I mean, I'm in Los Angeles. A lot of patients, they just cannot afford to have a scar. And I understand that. I had to give it to them knowing that we were not giving them 100% growth as opposed to a strip. And then, so obviously, uh, my patients, we were doing like 90% a strip, 10% FUE. As FUE got better, it was, as you said, it was the patient's demand. It was patients pushing us to give them FUE, not us choosing FUE. If, if right. it was not because of our patients and the demand of the our you know consumer base, we would still be doing a strip for years to come. So, so we, we know that patients want FUE. There's a certain group of patients that they cannot do it with anything but FUE. 
So we said, okay, if you is not good, how can we make it better now? Let's put together something. And uh, I don't know if, if, if you remember, um, it was probably seven, seven, eight years ago in one of the uh, World Congress of Hair Restorations, we had the first meeting of uh, our FUE research committee of, committee. Uh, you know, uh, International Society of Hair Restoration. So we put together a, a committee of, um, I think, 15 or 17 doctors all over the world. So these are doctors who are doing FUE more than others, not only FUE, uh, because FUE was still pretty new. I was the first chairman of it for the first two years. So we were working with, with all, all these clinics, you know, across the globe to see what is the best way of doing hair transplant. The whole understanding of it, we came up with you know, terminology to define how we can define things better so we can start doing publications and research and you know uh, different studies that we did. So that helped us to see what method works better, how we can move forward with this, and that changed everything. To my mind, after the first two years of being in that society, I learned so much, and then I started doing more and more FUE to the point that you know, right now in my practice, people have to push for a strip. They have to really beg for a strip. And I really, to be honest, I don't see a big indication that, that FUE, there is something that if a strip can do that FUE can't. Right. I don't right. think a strip will stay in the field much longer, maybe a couple more years. And I know some, for some, some doctors who do a strip on a regular basis, mostly a strip, it's difficult for them to switch to FUE. And I, I get it. I mean, I was there like a few years ago. I was exactly like that. I was not willing to give because I didn't want to give my patients a uh, lower quality hair transplant. But I think if FUE is done right with the right technology, it should give the same exact you know result with less complications. Yes. But but we get to the to the to the uh, uh, beginning of this talk is our ability to change as doctors and to adapt and adopt new techniques and and, and as you see patients are, are pushing for FUE I I rarely get a demand for FUT right now right. and right. even if and change is not change, easy not easy right change I mean think about it we learn something we become really good at it. And now I say, oh my God, you have to change now. Not only you, your team, your technicians, that's one of the biggest things that you have to retrain them. Yes, and they are sometimes resistant to change as well. So oh, the, well, entire, the entire office, the entire clinic has to, to accept the change, which is challenging, I, I get it, but it's inevitable if you want to stay there. I mean, I can't wait to start my TikTok account. I'm like now I'm like so <laughs> there we go. Yeah. inspired to do that. Like, it's yeah. really, really cool. <laughs> um, so I, I have a tip for you, Corona. Yes. Uh, yes. For the technicians that uh, we know that they're like some of these technicians are doing it for years. Even some of them are doing it before I start doing hair transplant. And now we want them to change their technique. Uh, we have this thing in our office. We really value change. So we em embrace change in our culture of our office. Uh, and one of the things that we do, we have this thing called employee of the season. Okay. That okay. One, thing, one employee is going to be selected as employee of the season. We put a, the name on the board and the, the, a nice check that they, they, they receive every quarter uh, when they become employee of the season. So one of the, e one of the fast tracks to become employee of the season is come up with something innovative. Uh -huh. Something uh -huh. that changed something around the OR operating room or anywhere in the office. And many times technicians come, I mean, they should think about it. They, they spend as much time in the procedure room and they directly work with patients. And oftentimes they come with the, the changes that we want. Right. And right. They, they know it's being, you know, rewarded and is, you know, uh, something that they, they look for ways they, they can improve the whole process, the whole Setting. procedure. Yes. You know how I, I sort of, uh, when I want to integrate something in my office, I, I tell my staff, don't worry, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution. So it's a little minor right. term for them to like, okay, yeah, exactly. it's not like a yeah, big easier change okay. right, <laughs> right away. Um, so speaking on, of FUE, we got a, a, another tool um, to play with that's a robot. What's your view on, on robotic? Are we going to go full robotic at some point or we are irreplaceable? 
know, I, I hope robot becomes better. I, I bought robot a couple of years ago and use, use it for, for a while. Uh, to be honest, the whole promise of robot was that it's something that could become better. Like, you know, like for example, Tesla, right? They have a system every month they come up with a new update. This is like automated, uh, you know, driving. Machine. Yeah. The robot system that we currently have was very slow. So at the beginning, I thought that's great. I don't have to keep doing this. I don't have to keep looking in the microscope and extract graphs. And we use it for a couple of months. And then we realized that the speed is not as good as the existing machines in the, in the market. Although it was easier for me to let the robot extract, uh, you know, extract the graphs, but at the cost of lower quality graphs for patients, which was not fair. And the cost so of time. Also, Time. And the cost of I'm time. Sorry? Cost of time. Yes, and, and it was not as much faster, right? And then, despite of the fact that we expected robot to become become better and better every day, the other machines started becoming better because they were smaller, less uh, costly, probably for for uh, manufacturers, and they become significantly superior to what we had, you know, ten years ago. To the point that robot was not even, it was not even worth looking at the robot. So it's sitting in my, one of my rooms, occupying the space. I don't know what to do with it. So, <laughs> but if, if somebody comes with the new other type of robot that is really co compatible with what we do today, I'm open to it, but we don't have it yet. Yes. Well, it, it also has an impact how it's marketed because some patients come and they say, I want robotic hair transplant. I want neograft hair transplant. It's what they, right. it's it's what what they hear because they don't understand it's not the procedure, it's the device doing certain type of the, of the procedure. So we will see where the marketing of these devices is also going to take the, the ultimate customer uh, slash patient. Um, right. So since you're, you're sitting on, in, in, in L.A. there, the, the probably the, the most interesting topic is to talk about celebrities because, you know, uh, as, as, as surgeons and, and cosmetic surgeons, in a sense, we are always off, uh, always ask, hey, have you done any celebrity person and who underwent uh, hair transplantation? And you have developed this amazing technique called celebrity hair transplantation. What is it? How do celebrities do their hair do transplantation? Their hair <laughs> <laughs> Some of my patients come in and say, should, should we be celebrity to get this procedure? Yes. <laughs> say, yes. No. So uh, when we started doing FUE procedure more and more, we had a subgroup of a patient who were coming and they wanted to do FUE. They didn't want to have a scar because they are actors. They, they want to have the option to shave their head with no scar. But at the same time, they're constantly in front of the camera and they don't have the time to even shave their head. That, that's not an option. Even layer shaving, even partial shaving was not an option. So again, as we discussed earlier, they pushed us to make the changes, to, to be in innovative. So uh, we have to give it to them. If it wasn't for my patient, I never had celebrity FUE procedure. So celebrity hair transplant started when I said, okay, so you want hair? We cannot give you that many, but we can give you a few if you come back if you come and we can remove one hair at a time and transplant it. So with FUE, we usually shave the head, make it nice and clean. So we can, under microscope, we can remove the grafts as fast as possible. So how can we do it without shaving? Initially, we were cutting one hair and removing it. Cutting another hair and removing. Imagine the long hair and the whole, you know, bleeding and everything that could happen. <sighs> my least favorite, my favorite day, day in the clinic. Day in the clinic. <laughs> I know. So, so my biggest number that I could promise to patient was 500, and that was like the 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 advertisement for celebrity is a smaller procedure, but some people have to come multiple multi multiple days back to back. And then we got better. And then when we got the uh, Trivellini system, especially when they came up with the long hair punch, 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 that was perfect. So you don't have to go. I mean, right now we go 1,800 per day, which right. is like not exactly this, as big as we can do with a regular FUE, but we can do a lot more, but still more limited. Um, so it, we reserve it for certain patients that are really cannot shave their head. Obviously, it's more expensive for them too because it's more labor intense. Right. 
Right. Uh, we have it. It's, it's a good thing. I think a lot of pe- people appreciate it. And the other components of it that we added to it is like simultaneous extraction and placement. So we make the sites first and then start extracting here one at a time and place at the same time. Uh, and you so have your patient, you on the patient on the side. Well, I start with the, after site making, we put patients on the side, one shoulder facing away from me, start from uh, the right uh, temple. Temple. And yeah. as we keep going toward the back, the next position is going to be face down. And as I'm extracting my, uh, as I'm excising the grafts, my technicians remove them, one of them count and sort under microscope and two technicians place them with Mohebi inserter into the mm-hmm. pre, pre-made sites. So the, the time that grafts stay out of the body is probably less than one hour. Right, right. So when so, you, uh, so when, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, so the, the limitation is this, the limit in the speed of placement. Uh, extraction goes mm-hmm. pretty fast, and I, sometimes I have to wait until my technicians catch up until we, we can keep going. When you transplant long hairs, because that's something that many, many people haven't heard of yet, um, is it more challenging for patients in the days after the procedure to maintain grafts in place? And what do you recommend them? And not, because, not really. I mean, uh, against the celebrity FU is not always long hair. Celebrity FU it could be done with regular flared sharp punch and cut grafts cut. short as they're removing them. So that's the most common way of doing it. Right. But long hair, right. occasionally people ask for it. I personally, I'm not a big fan. Right. Uh, right. Because eventually most of those grafts will fall out. In two or three uh, weeks. Two or three weeks. Right, right. But I mean, yeah. people who get it, they just have to be a little more careful not touching or not, not combing it regularly until after the f- day four. After day four, right. even if they lose the hair, it's not a big deal. They will grow it back. But uh, yeah, they have to be a little bit more, more careful with, with basically caring uh, or washing here after uh, precision for first four days. Right. And virtually in the backside, no one can tell uh, that the hair transplant went done, which, which is amazing. You know, I yeah, remember yeah, my yeah, first, yeah. my very first procedure was 400 grafts. I did it. I did extractions in over four hours. Uh, it, I was like, I thought I was on top of the world for extracting 400 grafts. Oh. Now I don't even do those pre- procedures anymore. And then now we're, we're basically pay, play, playing hide and seek through long hairs, looking for those trims ones. And, and my assistant is often going crazy searching for grafts through that long hair, but you have to do all of that, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's the, it's the necessity and demand. Right. Um, another interesting thing that I found uh, that you do is power hairline. And hairline is that delicate topic in, I would say, most men seeking hair transplantation. They like, they want perfect hairline or, or something that mimics their, uh, their hair when they were young. And we always battle with them where to put hairline and everything. And then I found this power hairline concept that you have. So what I would like to discuss with you is what is aging hairline and what is male pattern hair loss? How do you know where and when you can do power hairline? Well, I think aging hairline is not, you cannot put it in a different class than male pattern hair loss. I think there is some degree of, there's some overlap, right? Mm -hmm. But we know a lot of men who, are not genetically going bald. They're not losing hair. They're not even defined to have some even class three of hair loss. When they get past their, you know, 50s or 40s or 50s, if we see that the hairline is not as perfect as it was when they were in their 20s. So these people, I mean, just like everything else, that's part of aging. So it makes their face look older. If you just get a full person with full head of hair and just start with Photoshop, removing some of those hairs from the front and make it a little bit less thick. All of a sudden they look a little bit older. And that's exactly what happened. That's a process of aging in addition to sagginess of the face and wrinkles and everything. So that's one of the things. And then I started seeing a lot of these patients when FUE was becoming more popular. A group of my patients were just middle-aged men who were not balding. I mean, back then, 
when they were coming to us, we didn't even accept them as patients, right? So you don't have hair loss. You just hear, you just, you, you, you know. But then I realized, yeah. yes, they bring the patients of, uh, the picture of even 10 years ago, they had a solid hairline. Now they have kind of faded, faded hairline. I said, why not? You know, this patient's not going to lose hair. They're not going to, I don't have to protect his hair for future hair loss because there's no family pattern of hair loss. We do microscopic evaluation. There's no evidence of future hair loss. Why not get five, 500 grafts and put them right in the hairline or 800 and put them in the hairline? And then I did that and the result was amazing. They love it. It's just they give them the boost, the confidence that they had before. And I felt that like these people and... A lot of time, it starts with like executive people, higher end, political, you know, in society, there is an elite group of people who want to have like everything perfect, well-dressed, they put, uh, you know, watches on that are like $50,000 and they call it power watch. I said, hmm, so that's power hairline. That's exactly, exactly they want to sit on the board, say, this is who I am. I'm not having a fading hairline. I'm not balding. I am a strong man with a strong hairline. So we do market it that way. And people come asking for that today. Yes, I, I bet majority of our patient would love to have that youthful hairline as, as they had when they were when they were young. I mean, that's but it's like, how do you you they have to know that not all of them are candidates and that you determine based on the miniaturization in the back whether right. that's that's androgenic alopecia or just the aging of the on uh, the first two three right. centimeters in the front that you you can restore, but I love the concept. It's 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 brilliant. It's brilliant. I really, I really like I really, it. I really, I really Thank like you. It. Um, and um, so, from switching to today and going to to future, what are we what are we going to adopt and adapt to in the future? to stay in the field? How do you see hair treatments in the future, hair restoration in the future? What, what is your feel for that? Well, I think within the next few years, we're still dealing with like hair restoration and how we can do it. I'm not talking about 40 years from now, 50 years from now, that probably will have like, you know, hair multiplication. You can remove just one or two hair, multiply it in the lab and have thousands of hair to be implanted that we know it's, it's, it's going to happen because the science is there already. We, we know it's done. The fact is nobody has started doing the f- last phase, the, the third phase of the, the, the clinical trial yep. to see if yep. it's you know, safe and effective in long term. But before that, hair transplant could even get better. Now, still we do a procedures of like full day process of getting like 2,000, 2,500 grafts. And... I see in my own office, the limit limitation of the speed of process is not the extraction anymore because the devices that we have, we just spend probably two hours to get, you know, 2,000 grafts easily. Yeah. This, yeah. The, the limitation is the implantation. Yeah. The implantation is getting better with the new devices that we have. But now, if we can make it more automated, and then if we can get those grafts out and place them within minutes rather than hours or, you know, so that we do now. Yeah. Yeah. So that how, would be perfect. Did, so by the time that the extraction is over, the implantation could be shortly after that uh, done. Right. How did your implanter improve your practice? I know you designed your own Parsa implanter, Mohebi yeah, right. implanter. Right, right, right. Is it easy to learn how to use it? Use it's it? very easy to learn. Technicians, you can teach them probably for a couple of days. The second week, they are probably placing with like 75% speed of your senior technicians that have been doing it for years. Wow. It's wow. amazing. Yeah. 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 So, so the reason I came up with Mohebi Implanter was because we're doing simultaneous extraction and placement, right? So I want to have four people be able to work on patients' head at the same time. So as I'm extracting on the back of the head and, or on the side, and my technician removes them, we want to have two technicians to be able to put the grafts into the pre-made sites. Yes. Right? Yeah. So when you look at the whole uh, head and around the head area, you see like I'm standing here, my technician's over there, and there's just that much of a gap, like like less than 50, I mean, 90 degree of the whole circle that they have access to. And we want to fit two technicians there to place the grass. 
How is it possible? We said, okay, we're going to give them the loops that they don't have to be too close to the patient's head. They can go back and they can use a smaller pie, right? So you can, instead of using this, two hands, like how, like the other methods are using, so we have to give them a small chance. And then we don't have room for a loader team, a team to load the, uh, the implanters and hand it to them because it's just already packed. So I want to have a device that... Too many, men, too many, too many men on too ice. Too many men on ice. <laughs> so I want to have a device that people can sit back without getting too close to the patient's head with the loops that are like long distance focal, focal point, load the graphs and come close and place them. Load them without getting too much close. So it's just one hand that they don't have to even have both hands on the patient's head. They stay back and load and with one hand come close and place it. So that allows them that two technicians, they can have like a 15 degree of that pie, that uh, small window, they can fit one technician to start placing. That's how I came up with the idea of Momohebi implanter. And it's a, it's a dull implanter, right? It's right. dull. I have to make all the sites at the beginning. Right. So that's the, right. that's the, that's the beauty of it. So I can assign the, the you know, implantation to my technicians. If it was sharp, I had to make it myself. Exactly. Now exactly. the direction and distribution of the hair is already done. The technicians have to just load and place into the holes that they already made, that, that they're already there. And for that reason, yeah. they can start placing like five minutes after I start extracting. Yes. So when the first yeah. batch of extracted graphs are out, they can start placing them. Yes, that speeds the process tremendously. Yeah, because yeah. you're Helps simulta- a lot. Sim- sim- simultaneously doing both things: extraction and and and, and planting. Um, so tell me, just just to to conclude this story about the future, do you see hair cloning happening soon? I know you've been involved with research with that as well, and and. You know, yeah, you know, yeah, when yeah. patients ask us, for example, we put them on a therapy and they get jaded after a while and then try another therapy, another therapy. And then like, OK, doctor, when we run out of the options, what are we going to do? And we all like are praying for hair cloning, like that's going to save all our patients. Is that reality? That's or actually, is it yeah. going to be a reality that's soon? Actually, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't I'm not aware of any center that are working on the phase three of the study. We know phase three should happen. Uh, we know fa- phase three should be around eight to 10 years. So if tomorrow somebody comes and say, hey, we started phase three, we can say, okay, eight to 10 years from now, something we may have something practical in hand. Yes. But the fact that nobody has started it yet, we don't have that you know, timeline yet. So yes. unfortunately, I guess hair is not a priority to, to medicine as much as the diabetes and heart disease and cancer. And, and so nobody's COVID. putting COVID. any budget for hair. COVID now, obviously. And, and, and COVID, yes. Have you seen changes in your practice during COVID in terms of busyness, types of patients? I think we've been busier than before. Uh, for, we had to close for two months. Did you have to close too? Yes, we closed yes, for two we months closed too. closed for two months too. Two months. So, so after two months, we started it and we've been busy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of people actually found COVID to be a good opportunity to do hair. Uh, you know, individuals like attorneys that they have to go to court and this and that. And now they don't have to for a while. That's probably the only time they can come and get a hair transplant. The ones that want to shave head. Obviously, the non-shaving option is always available to people. Yeah. And also, you know, people are not traveling. They're not buying stuff. And right, they're, they're right. sitting at home and like figuring out what can they, how they can. Did you, did can. you find that to be a big factor in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. Here's the funny story. Uh, you know, my, my country was bombed in 1999 and, and, and the, the hospital that I later joined, the, 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 the head of the hospital told me they were the busiest during the time of bombing in the country. I don't know what is that. Is it psychology of people, you know? Busiest maybe for, you mean, for cosmetic, cosmetic surgery, cosmetic yes. Surgery. I yes. See. Is it I like see. Okay. if I die tomorrow, my, my, my wish was to have a beautiful nose or, or head of hair? You know, I want to I wanna make it happen. There is some push in that, okay, yeah. end of the world is coming. And people just want to fulfill their dreams. Maybe that's, that's part of it. You know, that's something somebody has to look into it. You remember, uh, uh, you probably, 
I don't know how it was over there, but in 2008, we, have, we had recession, right? Big crash. In America Big and crash. the whole world. Uh, America got hit hard and a lot of people lost jobs and a lot of companies went out of business. I started my practice during that time. And I, I obviously cannot compare because that was the first year of my practice. And obviously not many people uh, knew me. But we had a lot of patients who came to us. They lost their job. They don't have money. They get a loan to get a hair transplant because uh, they feel the urgency of they have to do it now. Now that I'm losing my job, this is a perfect time <laughs> to get a hair transplant at least. Yeah, there is there is some some in that phenomenon. You know, we always hear, oh, live live like you live only once, but people don't do that until they're like pushed with some external yeah, enemy, really feel enemy. It. invisible enemy in this case that can that can cause harm to them and they're like, yeah, Okay, like, I'm gonna live my life to, to its fullest. Um, I want to conclude this talk, talk with a few quotes from your Instagram. Okay. And I really like them. First one is, fill your head with beautiful hair, not negative thoughts, to begin with. Then also, great hair doesn't happen by chance. It happens by appointment. And I recently actually uh, on my YouTube ca- channel, um, you know, patients, I, 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 I talked about this patient come to you for hair loss treatment and they're like complaining, oh my God, I'm losing hair. Uh, and then you ask them, have they tried anything? And they say, no, I haven't tried anything. Well, start today, you know, make your appointment today and, and start doing something for your hair. It's not going to, it's going to, not going to change itself. And, um, and lastly, I like, I like few more, but this one is also, uh, the also good one. Good hair does not stay home on a Friday, especially when you have power hairline, I think. <laughs> That's right. Power hairline. <laughs> Parsa, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I can't wait to see you in person again, but I, I, I'm glad I saw you, uh, via Zoom. Uh, on this occasion. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for bringing me on, on online. And it's, it's, uh, it's good that you started doing this. I look forward to more episodes and I'll be one of your followers. We will be happy to host you again. I'm, close. Awesome. I'm now following what you're doing. So Perfect. when you come up with something new, we'll talk again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Parsa. Thank you, Parsa. All right. Take, take care. care. Bye-bye.